For the second part of the mechanics, uh, let me reintroduce uh, fungible tokens. They are a crucial uh, component of decentralized uh, finance. So let me review uh, the, the main protocols. So the most popular uh, protocol is the ERC-20, and ERC uh, represents Ethereum request for comment. So this is a protocol that can be used by anybody to create a token. As I mentioned in the course that I teach called Innovation and Crypto Ventures, uh, as part of what we do in that course is to create a token. It's very straightforward to do. The amount of code that you need is maybe 20 lines. And uh, it is generally available uh, to do that. So you don't need to be uh, a Solidity programmer to actually launch uh, a token. It's very straightforward. You just need to set uh, basic parameters like the number of tokens and the divisibility of the token, and you are done. So it is remarkable that you could launch a token so easily. So uh, ERC is a fungible token, and as we kind of went through in terms of what that means, that means that every single token is identical in value. Just like every single $1 bill is identical in value. And 10 $1 bills is identical to a $10 bill. So these, uh, this is the basic idea of fungibility. And the great thing with the ERC-20 uh, protocol is that the tokens that are created with this protocol can interact with each other uh, very easily. So uh, any ERC token uh, that's created on the Ethereum blockchain can interact with any smart contract that's created. So it, it, it's, it's not siloed. Uh, basically, it's interoperable, a very powerful uh, feature. So the integration is a big uh, advantage for uh, ERC-20. Uh, and uh, again, within a, a program to create uh, an ERC-20, certain key aspects that I've already mentioned, things like you need to set uh, the total supply, um, you need to be able to read the balance of a particular uh, user, there's transfer, approval, all this stuff is, is kind of basic stuff that's layered uh, into the smart contract uh, for it to operate uh, efficiently. So this is uh, very straightforward uh, to actually uh, pull off. So let me introduce the idea of a fungible token that is an equity token. And I don't want you to confuse this with another type of token that might actually represent a share of equity. So we've already talked about the possibility of widespread tokenization, where you could have a token that represents uh, an ounce of gold or a gram of gold. You can have a token that represents a share of Apple, and maybe it's divisible by a million. So you could buy a millionth of a share of Apple. This is not what I'm talking about when I talk about equity token. An equity token has got a particular meaning that's going to be important. So basically, this token is going to represent your ownership or your equity in uh, a pool um, or some particular underlying asset. Okay, so think of a pool and you've got a share of that pool. And what we'll do is to issue an equity token that represents your share of the pool. So let me go through and uh, give a simple example. So we'll have a token, um, which we'll call TKN, and it's got a fixed supply of 10,000, okay? And this token is corresponding to an Ethereum pool that has got 100 Ethereum in it. Okay, in the smart contract, they're basically, it's holding some Ethereum. Okay, and there's a token 
that corresponds to that pool. Okay, so, so what does that mean? Well, that means that if we've got 10,000 of these tokens, and they represent a share of this pool with 100 Ethereum in it, well, that means that the exchange rate is 100 token per Ether. Okay, so, so this is basically just showing um, what the, the ownership is of the pool. So token is a way, and it will be an ERC-20, uh, to represent ownership uh, in a pool. So uh, it's also possible that token can appreciate in value. So we've got a pool of Ethereum that's increasing at 5% uh, per year. So then our uh, our 100 uh, uh, of the uh, TKN token, they represent one Ethereum, but there's also the possibility of this uh, 5%, um, and again, possible perpetual uh, cash flow from it. Okay, so, so this uh, basically allows us, uh, given this structure, we can, we can instantly see what the value of the uh, TKN actually is. We know what's in the liquidity pool. It represents a share of the liquidity pool, and we can instantly figure out what the value is in terms of the base asset in the liquidity pool, which is uh, Ether in uh, this particular uh, example. Okay, so um, it turns out that uh, this could be uh, even richer in terms of the possibilities. And in the third course, DeFi Deep Dive, we will talk about variable interest rate mechanics that is used in a compound uh, protocol, which we'll spend a fair bit of time on uh, because it's a very important uh, protocol. Um, it's possible that the contract or the liquidity pool has got more than one thing. So I give you the example where there's 10,000 token issued as equity token on a 100 uh, Ethereum uh, pool. Well, what if there's other things in the pool? So there might be Ethereum in the pool. There might be uh, USDC, the stablecoin uh, based on the US dollar, or DAI, or many other things that reside upon the Ethereum blockchain. Okay, so it could be much more general in terms of the, uh, the, uh, the ownership. And indeed, this could be dynamic. So what's in the pool could be dynamically changing with a set of rules. And we'll talk about this when we talk about set protocol in the third course, where you can literally have an algorithmic trading strategy that's hard-coded into the contract that is swapping in and out of, let's say, Ethereum and uh, USDC, uh, and you can own a share of that with an equity uh, token. So very uh, powerful uh, idea. So there are at least three different types of tokens. So we just talked about an equity uh, token. There are also utility tokens. So this means that this token is required uh, to utilize the functionality of a particular contract. Okay, so it's providing utility in that you need it to actually run the contract. Okay, so the value is determined by how useful that contract actually is. Okay, so there's many different types of utility tokens. So uh, a utility token could be used for collateral. Uh, it could be used for reputation or staking. Um, it might be a stable coin. So I mentioned USDC. The decentralized version of a stable coin would be something like DAI, which we'll talk about in great detail in the third course. Uh, so, so all stable coins are 
uh, utility uh, tokens um, in terms of uh, decentralized finance. And it's also possible that uh, it is being used to, to pay uh, fees for a particular application. So all these are just examples of what utility tokens uh, can actually uh, be used for. So it's, it's kind of interesting, I guess, uh, the, the last uh, example I want to spend uh, a little bit of time on uh, in terms of the stablecoin uh, utility uh, coin. So stablecoins, there's many different types of uh, stablecoins. And we will go into some detail on this. There are uh, physically collateralized uh, stablecoins like USDC. So there are dollars that are sit in some vault somewhere. Uh, and there are crypto collateralized like DAI. So uh, with DAI, it's over collateralized with um, Ether or any, well, a list of uh, ERC-20 uh, compliant uh, tokens, or it could even be algorithmic. Okay, so, so the idea here is that um, there's different ways to think about the value. So for something like USDC, you rely upon institutions that are centralized, like um, Coinbase that guarantees that a USDC is worth $1. But there's other methods. So for the crypto collateralized, you rely upon a transparent system where you can see that the currency is backed by collateral. And anybody can see it at any time. And it is backed by more than enough collateral um, and if that collateralization ratio gets too low, then that might impact the value. It might impact the peg to the stable coin. So there's a big incentive to keep that collateralization high. So again, there's a different approach. One is more centralized than the other, and we'll have much more uh, to say uh, about this. So the third type of token is a governance token. So this is the third type of fungible uh, token. So, and I want to distinguish because it is a little confusing because we think in, in terms of centralized finance. So you buy uh, some shares of IBM and we call that equity. And actually you have voting rights at the annual general meeting or for special resolutions. So that is both uh, a share of the equity of IBM, as well as governance. So in decentralized finance, the equity tokens are basically representing the share of the assets in the pool or in the smart contract. There is another level of governance of that smart contract. So the protocol might have a governance token and those that own the token are able to vote on changes. Some parameters might be variable in that smart contract. Okay, so for example, we'll talk about collateralization. So if you're collateralizing uh, a stable coin with a very risky and volatile uh, cryptocurrency, then you have to have more than 100% collateral. And you can imagine that if that cryptocurrency became even more vo vo volatile, then what we want to do is to increase the collateralization ratio. And that's the sort of thing that the governance would vote on. Okay, so, so basically these contracts um, uh, often have, again, completely transparent, certain parameters that can be changed by governance. And again, I want to loop back to a very interesting aspect of this. That if the governance changes one of those parameters, and that led to people having a bad experience, then what's going to happen? Well, 
if the basic idea was good, somebody is going to grab the code, which is completely open source, and change the parameter back or have a different system uh, implemented so that they attract the people that left uh, the old platform. Okay, so you need to be really careful in terms of the governance, that you don't do something that causes your, um, your protocol uh, to lose value. So the incentives are, are exactly aligned. So governance tokens are, are, are very important. And let me mention another item that's, that's really important. Often when a new idea is launched, the developers know that there's, there's gonna need to be a certain number of changes that potentially need to happen very quickly. So, so basically there'll be some bumps in the road. So often the developers or devs will re retain um, like the majority control of the governance token. Okay, so uh, this has happened with a number of popular protocols, but, and this is important, they say that we'll retain control in the short term, but we've got a schedule whereby we will go and essentially uh, make this truly uh, decentralized. And that means that the developers lose their majority uh, control. And this has, again, happened with a number of important uh, DeFi protocols. And indeed, uh, it's very interesting that in some of them, the governance tokens were just distributed, uh, so-called airdropped, uh, to those that were using the protocol. So if you're using it uh, in terms of putting liquidity into the protocol, then you get a reward of the governance token. If you're using it to borrow, then you get a reward. Okay, so uh, the governance token essentially was used as an incentive. Okay, but this idea, again, you're really only truly decentralized finance if you are decentralized, which means uh, that there's no one group that has control. But again, think of the short term and the long term. So uh, again, there's many different ways to implement a governance token. So it might be that there's a fixed supply, and then when that supply runs out, it, that's it. Uh, it's also possible to have a governance token that has got some sort of uh, inflationary uh, rule. So uh, the token can, the total number of token can increase. So Maker, which we'll talk about, and that's the governance token for uh, DAI, um, that has got a static supply. Uh, comp, which is the governance token for compound, that has got uh, an inflationary supply. And again, they use it as an incentive. So to use the platform, and think about this, that if you deposit your money into a liquidity pool, you get some sort of interest rate, um, a savings rate, but you're also being rewarded with the governance token, which makes the rate of return even higher. Or think about borrowing. So you're paying um, a rate on the loan, which uh, is most of the time far less than, let's say, a bank loan. But you're also being paid the governance token. It's basically is an incentive to do what you're doing. So that reduces the effective rate that you're paying on the loan uh, even more. So very uh, powerful idea.